Good morning. Uh, after yesterday with my Sooners, I might need your encouragement this morning. So please be very kind to me. Uh, it's good to be here. I got to tell you, it's strange to walk in a building and see your face on like six different screens. Uh, I've never been on a wanted poster before, but that's what it felt like. Maybe a better way, but uh, at least to my knowledge, I've never been on a wanted poster. But anyway, it's strange. So maybe next week after I'm gone, you should just start putting up different members on that screen and just see how they react. That's a, that'd be interesting. Uh, I'm thankful to be here. Uh, it's good to be back. I was here in August, and I really enjoyed my time with you. Uh, you're a very welcoming and inviting group of people, and I know my brother and my sister-in-law came too, and we really enjoyed it. And so I'm thankful to be back. And I was asked to speak on two specific topics this morning. And this one is the greatest challenge the church faces. That's a pretty bold um, sermon topic and sermon title. And I, I'll, I understand this. My answer is going to be somewhat subjective to me. I'm a young guy. I understand my answer might have to do with some of my experience or the pulse that I've felt in my time in ministry or in my generation in the church. But I do believe my answer was one very acceptable one. But I thought before I give you my answer, I might ask you. And so I don't know if you talk during Bible class. I hope you do. I also know you're very far away, some of you. So hopefully I can hear or I can sprint down there and ask. But before I give you what I will say, I thought, what do you think is the greatest challenge that the church faces today? Now understand real quick, I'm not saying what's the greatest problem going on in Choctaw. That's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about in terms of the church in Oklahoma, in America, and that probably affects here as it affects everywhere. But what's the greatest challenge do you think the church is dealing with and the obstacle they have to overcome or handle? So what would you say, anybody? Media. media? Okay. That's the greatest challenge the church faces. Why would you say media, or what do you mean by that? Because they're glorifying all the stuff that the Christians were 16 and pregnant on MTV a lot of other sh similar shows and stuff like that, trying to promote all the anti-Christian lifestyle. That's why I say media. That okay. Facebook, TV, whatever, media. So, so really how sin has been exposed to us through media and everything, because we, we had taken it in a lot. And so all the sin we see on TV, social media, I think that's, am I getting that right of what you're saying? Yeah, that's a challenge that we, we face. Okay, did someone else say something or was? Commitment. Commitment. Okay, just in the, what do you mean by that? Okay. Yeah, so we kind of want to commit, but yet in our actions, we will in our words, but not necessarily in our actions. Okay, that's a challenge in the lives of a church and an individual. Yes. said distractions just how busy we are in life and you kind of talked about there's some clear things we know we need to work on but yet a lot of subtle things we need to work on we don't really know because we're so busy just doing things with work and everything else anyone else yes I think over the years, court rulings have taken prayer out of schools and, and just you know so many things that, uh, that we can't, we can't uh, show our religion okay court rulings uh, kind of you've seen to become more of a secular society, kind of pushing away from Christian values and ideals, and that's been a challenge for the church. Okay, anyone else? Yes? I think we've kind of lost our focus on being an outreach church. I think we've kind of said back, well, we've got to deal with the COVID, we've got other kind of problems, but we've really not maintained that continued focus on we need to be reaching out to people, our next door neighbors, people we know, our family. I think we've kind of let that slip away and we just kind of become acceptable of, well, whatever it is, that's what it is. Yeah. So we've become very inward focused. With, in the last few years, as you said, haven't helped, but we have this challenge of needing to get back to reaching out to people. Uh, okay, that's, that's a challenge. Any others? Yes. It's 
it's related to everything that's already been saying. Said, what are how simple the message is, and what it takes to fulfill our duty. Okay. And, and all these other distractions pull us away from that. And it's just we're given what we need to know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we don't try to learn or to understand more. Yeah. We grow. But the simple message and the conviction, and and we don't rely upon that. Is how overwhelming it is. <clears throat> if you think about when someone becomes a Christian, they're overwhelmed. Yeah. They're, they're literally, I'm not making it heaven. I've got all these problems. And I've got an opportunity. And they're literally overwhelmed. And they've got the answer right there. And then they become a Christian and they confess their name. And then that simple message gets diluted or we get distracted. Or that's our whole duty is to help other people find that out. Okay, so. This challenge of helping people to grow and the simple message because it can be, can be overwhelming when they come into Christ and there's so much there. Um, some good answers. I, like I said, my mind might be a little subjective. I thought of a few when I, when I heard it originally. One was the amount of young people that are leaving the church. Um, I was in youth ministry for almost seven years. I'm telling you, it's, I'm not going to share statistics with you, but I think we know if we look around that we see the younger generations are leaving when they get out of youth group in high school, or even then, college age, young adults, young families, we're seeing a lot of this generations that, you know, the church relies upon, and they're leaving, and that is alarming, and that's a challenge we have to deal with. Another one I thought of was consumerism. Don't we live in a culture that says everything is about what can you give to me? And what happens a lot in the church, I think, is we see all these businesses trying to sell themselves, so now we're in this arms race of how nice of a building can we have, and how can we sell ourselves to you instead of maybe just being the church and sharing Jesus? And so consumerism is one. But I, here's the answer I'll give you. The greatest challenge I believe the church faces is the crisis of leadership. And I'll tell you, it's a crisis. It's not a challenge. It's a crisis. I want to share some stats with you real quick. It's estimated that there are eleven to 12,000 congregations of the Lord's Church, of the Church of Christ in the world. Of that number, it has also been estimated that 65% of those congregations do not have elders. 65% have zero elders. Somewhere, or then let's go even further. Uh, Roy Johnson, he's the director of Lads to Leaders. And he once said uh, about this recently that the remaining 35% of those congregations... Half of them that have elders only have two. They are one death, one grave illness away from having no elders. Does that seem like a crisis to you? A crisis of leadership. Uh, of every congregation, I know I'm young, but of every congregation I've ever worked with or known, I have never heard of any kind of ongoing practice for developing and training leaders. Now, I've seen it where our young people learn how to speak, and lead in worship. And I've seen some things like that, but no consistent training or method of developing people to become leaders. Uh, further on that, Phil Sanders, anyone familiar with Phil Sanders in Search of the Lord's Way? He said this, he said that we are averaging 111 congregations per year closing their doors. That's unsustainable. To lose this many leaders, to be losing that many churches, and it's related. Uh, we're facing a crisis of leadership in the church in America. Does that sound like a crisis to you? Now, how many elders do we have here? Five? Six? Six. We have more than we think. Um, do you realize how much of a minority you are? You are not the rule. You're the exception. And I think a lot of times churches that are in cities or near cities don't realize how much of a minority they are. And... Maybe they're, I don't want to say blind, but they don't realize what's going on. And, and hopefully they do, because if they're not careful, it might hit them in the future. But you're a minority here to have that many elders. But yet this is still true, and it still might be affecting this congregation in some ways. And it's absolutely affecting many others. And so I believe the greatest 
challenge the church faces is the crisis of leadership. Uh, I get the need for evangelism. I really do. Uh, the Great Commission, if we're familiar with it, go into all the world and make disciples, that's necessary. But we've placed in many congregations a great emphasis on evangelism, and yet we're still not growing. Why is that? There's many possible reasons for that. Uh, you might, I've heard people say, and you might have heard people say this, you know, people just aren't interested in truth anymore. You ever heard someone say that? Young people don't care. I don't personally believe that. I'm a part of that generation. I don't believe people aren't interested in the message. I will say that many of them aren't interested in our methods. It's not the message, it's the methods. And there's some... There's some merit to that from my friends who are unchurched or who've left the church, but they're interested in truth. There's hundreds of reasons to answer this question, but maybe it's that we don't have the leadership to lead us to finding and reaching those people. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but what? I wonder if today it's the harvest is plentiful, but the leaders are few. You ever heard the phrase, putting the cart before the horse? You ever said that, maybe? I think that is what has happened in some churches, some congregations. If the horse is leadership, if the horse is leadership and leadership development and the cart is evangelism, I think you can see my point. Reaching all these people but having no leaders to help them and grow them and shepherd them and lead them to where they need to be. So now we have, in many churches, few or no leaders who can guide this cart of evangelism, who can guide this cart of growing, a, helping grow a congregation. We need firebrands. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but firebrands. Leaders who can mentor the next generation to lead. John Wesley was attributed with this quote. He says, when you set yourself on fire, people will come from miles to watch you burn. That's a thought. We need leaders with the kind of passion that ignites fire in others and they want to follow in their steps. Leaders who train and mentor others to lead. And so the truth is this, we can wonder why there aren't no leaders in many congregations, but if we aren't training, preparing them, we shouldn't be very shocked. If we aren't doing something to prepare tomorrow's leaders today, we shouldn't be surprised when there are none. And we leave sheep without a shepherd in some ways. Uh, so, and I'll say this, if we don't prepare tomorrow's leaders today, then we failed. If when I die, my ministry ends, and I have influenced and affected or trained nobody to take up that ministry themselves, not even necessarily in that specific location, but anywhere, I don't know if I've done what I'm supposed to do. If when we pass, there's no one to fill our shoes we haven't completed the mission. Imagine if Moses dies and there's no one left. What happens to Israel? What if Jesus has this wonderful ministry but never trains the twelve? We have to be training tomorrow's leaders today. And so, uh, that's kind of the point. We've got we to gotta prepare tomorrow's leaders today for this crisis of leadership. There are eight things I think we see in Jesus' life when it comes to training leaders. I'm just going to share four of them with you for time's sake. They all start with the word I because I, you know, I want to be a nice little preacher who uh, makes everything match. Uh, but I'm just going to share four with you. And so if you want to mark these down, these are four things I think we can implement in congregations today to help train and implement leaders. Uh, number one would be this. Inclusion. When you look at the model of Jesus, you find inclusion. When Jesus called his disciples to follow him, we see that he's not only focused on those who are most likely to follow. What were some of the jobs of the people that he called? When you think about the 12, what were some of their occupations? Fishermen. Okay, that's one. What? Tax collector. Would you pick a tax collector? Especially if you lived in that time and you understand what that meant. As a Jew, would you pick a guy who helps the Romans? Uh, what were some other jobs? A zealot. Okay, Jesus didn't just ask the people who were most likely to follow. He included a lot of variety of people when it was training them to become leaders. He called tax collectors, he called fishermen, he called zealots. Generally, we find him including those who we would have never included or who would have been considered. Some words in their definition, you know, diversity. 
That means everyone has a seat at the table. Inclusion means everyone at the table has a voice. And belonging means everyone's voice is heard. And today, perhaps we need to be more inclusive when looking for those who have an interest in learning to lead. And if you're worried about what I'm saying, I'm not saying we ignore biblical mandates for leadership. Obviously not that. But what I am saying is sometimes we have these unbiblical preconceived notions of who a leader is or what a leader is. And so we miss out on wonderful people who have great potential to lead because of our own ideas and thoughts. If we only look for those that seem to fit our idea of a leader, we might find ourselves with no, no one to lead. You ever heard an eldership say something like this? We've looked around the congregation and we just don't see anyone qualified. You ever seen an elder, heard an eldership say that? One response would might be this. Well, what are we doing to qualify them? Isn't that a lot of times what happens? We wait around for someone to organically pop up like Super Mario and just be a leader. It's like they'll just pop out of the blue. No, we have to be training them because leaders don't just happen. Leaderships, leaders must be developed. So we have to be doing something to qualify them. And so maybe what we should do is this with inclusion. Let's invite or include everyone who is interested in being a leader, and then let's let the training sift out the wheat from the chaff, if you will. Let's include everyone. And then the training will figure out who's going to be qualified to lead or not. And worst case scenario, even if they're not qualified, you've helped people in your congregation become a better leader, and they might be the ones to help make other leaders who will be qualified one day. So one is inclusion. Any thoughts or comments before we move on to another? I don't know if what I'm saying is like, I can't believe he just said that, or if it, you're like, okay, I get it or not. He's got some faces like, oh, <laughs> hey, you asked for it. I didn't ask for this. I'd be preaching on something much different this morning, but I was asked for this. So in inclusion is one. Uh, but here's a second if you're writing down. Number two, invitation to invite. When we look at the model, G model of Jesus similarly, similarly we find that he had many disciples who followed, but he only invited 12 to fill a specific role of becoming leaders for the future of the church. In Luke chapter 6, if you have your Bible real quickly, open up to Luke chapter 6. I don't know if you're familiar with what Jesus did before he invited these 12, but it's very interesting. And I think there's a powerful point for us to understand from it. You look at Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 12. Before Jesus invited 12 men to train to become a leader for the future of the church, here's what he did. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, who he named, excuse me, Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the, zealous, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. But notice, what did he do before he invited 12 men to train for leadership? Spent the whole night in prayer. I think we need to consider that example when it comes inviting, to inviting people to to be put in a position of learning how to lead. First and foremost, we have to pray. Have you ever heard a public prayer about training people to become leaders? Or God sent us people that we may train to lead? I'll be honest with you. I've heard plenty of prayers for preachers and elders and deacons, and I'm thankful for them. I've been a recipient of them. And I've heard plenty of prayers on the behalf of those who have been, their names been put up to become a deacon or elder. I'm not sure I've ever heard a prayer about God, please send us people that we can train. But yet Jesus spent all night praying for these people that he was going to pick to train to become a leader. When's the last time or any time that you've spent a whole night praying for God to send you people that you may train to prepare to lead or just praying all night for your leadership? I'm, I'm not saying that from a position of I do it all the time. I'm, I don't know if I've ever done that. But yet that's the model we find with Jesus. Before he invited people, he prayed. James says this in, in his letter, you, ha you do not have because you do not ask. And I wonder in many congregations without leaders, are we asking? 
How we've been praying to God for it. How we've been praying God to send us people that we may train and prepare to become a leader. And so we need to consider those that we would like to become leaders. And here's a key point. Don't ask them immediately to become a leader. Ask them to prepare and train to become one. Ask them to, hey, would you be interested in, in being in this role where we can train and prepare you where they can learn to become leaders. And I promise you, more people are going to be willing to learn to become a leader than just jump into leadership out of the blue. And I think that step alone could help in many congregations. And so those are two, and we're flying by. And I, I don't know what time. We get out 1010, is that correct? I don't know. I just wait for the bell. Okay, wait for the bell. Well, I hope I have enough material because I thought I have way too much, so I cut it down in half. But All right, number three. Well, any questions or comments on that one with invitation and inclusion before we jump ahead? All right. All right. Number th so far, so good. He said so far. OK, I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. I said that. Uh, number three. When it comes to the life modeled by Jesus. We see that he invested in people. Number three, if we're going to prepare tomorrow's leaders today, we have to invest. When it comes to his the model of Jesus, he invested time in the lives of the apostles how long was Jesus' ministry on earth? Three years. three years. Okay, around that time, he spent three years investing in the lives of these men greatly. He prepared them in every way. He prepared them in their faith, right? We see the instruction he gives. He prepares them in their compassion for others. He shows them what it's like to be compassionate towards people over and over again. And he prepares them in every single way. He walked... And they followed. But notice, firstly, he walked. And they followed his example. But he was investing in their life. And that's going to be no difference today. If we're going to find people who will rise up and lead, we're going to have to invest in their life. But what keeps us from doing that? What keeps us from really investing in the lives of people? Waste of time. I hope we don't think it's a waste of time, but I, and I know you're not saying that. But oftentimes, we're so busy that there are other things that are more important. I think you had your hand up. That's similar to what you're saying is the time committed yeah. that you feel like you have to put in. Yeah, we're so busy today, which sometimes I've heard, you know, we're busier than ever before. I don't know if that's true. I, it, you know, I guess we might have more options of things or we can travel further and that helps, but... We are busy. We fill our lives with schedules. We have kids who, who are in choir band, basketball, um, some council and chess club all at the same time. I don't know how you have a kid like that, first of all. I might run for president one day with that kind of uh, you know, list of accomplishments. But we're so busy. We have jobs and everything else. And so we don't have time to invest. I tell you, there's nothing more important in training leaders than investing time. And the truth is, that's just a really good excuse. But there's no way we're ever going to prepare leaders if we don't invest. I know we're busy, but we can't be too busy to invest in people. I would say in your Christian life, the reason why you're here this morning, the reason why partly that you became a Christian is because somebody invested in you. That's true in leadership, too. I'll tell you, I would not be a preacher if it wasn't, and I don't even know if I'm good enough to be called a preacher, but I would not be one if it wasn't for guys, and I don't know if you know any of these names, but Aaron Austin was a youth minister of mine. I think he's in a very small town. I can't remember the name. It's Stigler, maybe. Um, I, he invested in my life. My parents got divorced. He took me out to lunch every single day, or one day every week for a long time. Guys like Logan Cates who spent time with me and said, hey, I'm speaking on a summer series tonight. Come with me. He was at Southwest originally. He's in Durant now. Uh, there's plenty of others who just, they poured into my life. They showed me examples. They, were, they cared for me. They spent time with me. And then they trained me. And if it weren't for men like that, I wouldn't be a preacher. That's going to happen with your elders and your deacons and your teachers. That's going to happen with leaders in your home. You have to invest your time in them. And so... You have to invest, which means this, and I have bad news for elders this morning, all six of you. There's no get-rich-quick scheme to prepare leaders. There's nothing that you can do that says, you know what, in six months, we're going to have four guys who are ready to step up. That they're going to be ready. You know when the best time to plant a tree is? 
20 years ago. You know the second best time to plant a tree? Today. That's the truth when it comes to leadership. The best time to start preparing men to lead or preparing leaders was a long time ago. But don't let that be an excuse to not start today because it's a crisis. Because if you'll do it today in 20 years when maybe there's even more churches, unfortunately, that are struggling from this crisis and who have closed doors, you'll look and say, I'm so glad we started preparing tomorrow's leaders today. Because now look. And that cycle will help greatly. But it's going to happen if we invest. And so we have to be willing to do that, to invest in the lives of others, to prepare them in their faith and compassion for others and so much more. Okay, fourthly, here's what we have to do. We have to involve. We're going to have to involve people if we want them to become leaders. Jesus did more than teach, which, by the way, originally this comes after the point of instruct. There is teaching there. But he did more than that. He got them involved in the ministry of leading. The limited commission. We're familiar with that, anybody? Jesus sent out the 70 to do what? Go to the house of Israel. Interesting here. He's preparing them to lead. And what does he do to prepare them to lead? He lets them lead somewhat. In order to get them ready to serve, what are they doing? Serving. He involved them in the work of leading and ministry. He's involving the disciples in activities that would, of service that would help prepare them for the role of service. We find several occasions where he sends them to prepare for events and sends them to prepare for things that are about to occur. He got them involved in service because he was trying to train them to become leaders. And he did that, he did that by allowing them to lead and to serve before their time was even come to do so. And the church today, I think we can do a better job. We can do a better job of involving people in various roles to help them prepare for leading. Okay, some more stats for you. I know we love them. In 2019, the Barna Group, that's a group that does a lot of religious surveys. They did a survey with more than 15,000 people ages 18 to 35. Okay, that's what we call the connected generation, which I find a little ironic because all of us stare at our phones the whole time. How many people? Uh, 15,000. 15,000 people they surveyed, all ages 18 to 35, and here are the results of the survey. And this, this was at the start of the, ban- the pandemic, which is pretty good timing, but uh, anyway, 82% of the people that were surveyed indicated that we are facing a leadership crisis, and nearly half of them said one of the reasons is because older leaders are not allowing the younger generation to actually lead. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason or that's true in every congregation or even here. Don't, don't shoot the messenger, <laughs> please. I didn't come up with a survey. You asked for it. I'm going to keep saying that. But half of them said one reason that we're not having leaders is because older leaders will not allow younger leaders to lead. Here's what the president of Barna said. If we do not make room for younger leaders today, they will not be around tomorrow. That's true. If we give them no responsibility and no opportunity to serve and lead today, they're not going to be here when we absolutely need them. And I would say we need them already. And I don't know what the makeup of this congregation is, but I'll tell you, in many churches, you walk in, you look around, and you can see this problem. Where all the people who we rely on for leadership, as they get older, we don't see anyone who's waiting to fill in their shoes. We see no one there. They, it's more of a question mark of what's going to happen next. And partly it might be because we're not allowing people to lead now, involving them in leading today. So we need to get people involved. We need to let them lead. We have to start them when they're young. We have to give them responsibility, and here's a good point, and some authority to do the work. You ever been given a a big responsibility but no authority in your work? You know what I mean? Like, hey, I need you to do these things, but you have no authority to actually do it and really, and really try to do this. You have someone breathing down your neck the whole entire time. Where it's like, am I really leading or serving, or am I just, I have a boss screaming at me the whole time. And before you make a decision, come talk to us about it and make sure we approve. Yeah, before you, hey, would you lead this for us? But before you do anything, come talk to us about it so we can approve it. Hey, deacons. <laughs> I've been in congregation where that's kind of the role. It's like, hey, we want you to serve in this ministry, but... Every decision you make and everything you do, come back to us for this, 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 and this. And 
that really discourages people from serving and leading. Because we haven't really given them any responsibility and authority to do the work. What are some reasons we're scared of letting young people lead? Let's be real, I'm scared of it. I'm young, technically, but why, 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 why might we be scared of letting young people lead? They're going to make a mistake. How many would you agree with that one? Not all your hands are up. You're liars. Uh, but, yeah, uh, we're scared where they're going to fail. How would you answer that? Hey, you know who else is going to fail? Everybody. <laughs> they're absolutely going to fail. When you give them this responsibility and authority, they are absolutely going to fail. But in truth, all of us in leadership are going to fail. We're all making mistakes, but that's how we grow. But, yeah, they're going to fail. We all are. Let them fail. What do we do when they fail? Absolutely. Pick them up and set them out. That's what preparing people to lead looks like. It's, hey, we'll give you this responsibility and authority. And, yeah, you absolutely might fail, but we're going to come alongside you. We're going to find out what happened. We're going to see where you went wrong. We're going to pick you up and encourage you. And we're going to find a way to fix it. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to give you another opportunity. Does that apply to any of the uh, 12 that Jesus picked? Peter. Peter. Hey, Peter, I'm going to spend three years of my life investing into you. And near the end of my life, you're going to fail miserably. You know what we're going to do? You're not qualified anymore. See ya. I would suggest that what we see with Peter is he is very discouraged and maybe even thinking about quitting possibly after his mistake. He goes out back to what he used to do, fishing in the boat. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back to what I used to do, what my father was good at, what I'm good at, because maybe I'm not good at this leading disciples thing. But you know what Jesus did? He comes alongside them. He talks to Peter. He encourages Peter. He says, I know you failed. I still love you. And he gives him another opportunity. And who preaches the first gospel sermon? Peter. He let a young man have some responsibility and authority, and even though he failed, he treated him with love, he respected him, he encouraged him, he corrected him, and then he let him go again. That's what the church needs to be doing with young people, helping them to be leaders tomorrow, today. But it's going to have to be with involving them. We're going to have to find ways to let young people lead There's a variety of ways. Maybe we need to be more creative in that. But there are so many ways in which we can let young people uh, start working on their leadership today by leading. That starts in a youth group. That starts, uh, but even before then, for young adults, that starts. Even if they don't, I'm a single guy. I'm not qualified to be an elder. Doesn't mean you can't prepare me to be one. You can give me other ways to lead and serve outside of those that will help train and prepare me. That's what the church needs to be doing, is involving people so that they can grow to be a leader. There's four others, and if you're interested in that material, I can help share some of that with you maybe later. But those were the four I brought, so I didn't talk your ear off more than I'm already called to do. Yes? I'm just thinking in terms of mistakes, when you let people make mistakes. Yeah. I I don't know about anybody else, but the mistakes I've made have been some of my greatest learning experiences. He said the mistakes he's made have been some of his greatest learning experiences. Amen to that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know how you become a great leader? You fail. I mean, you're prepared, but you fail. You're gonna gonna mess up quite a bit, and you can learn and grow from them. That's absolutely true. Uh, And so those are four points. I'll, I'll just conclude with this. We need a plan. We need a way to approach the development of leaders, and we cannot wait until tomorrow. It's a crisis. We have to prepare today. And so I would encourage us to to implement these four steps in our congregation. Um, You might be doing some of these already. That's fantastic. Um, But if you're not, put those into practice. Because in 20 years, in 30 years, what do you you want the the Church of Christ here in Choctaw to look like? I would imagine all of you want a vibrant, strong leadership. That has a future of strong leadership. We have to start that today. It won't just magically happen and occur. Imagine what would happen... If the church's reputation was a little different, what if, what if the people in our communities knew that if you wanted to be a leader, go to the Church of Christ? If you want to be a leader in your home, go to the Church of Christ. They'll prepare you. If you want to be a leader in your schools or in your communities, go to the Church of Christ. They're going to prepare you. If you want to be a leader in the church, go to the Church of Christ. They'll help prepare you. 
I think people would be flocking to that. I want to learn how to be a leader. If we develop that kind of reputation of preparing and training people to lead, I think we'll turn this around. And then the evangelism, which is very important, will take care of itself. Because then we have people who are pulling the cart. They're finding the fields that are ripe for harvest and they're taking them there. And then when we reach these people, we have leaders who can shepherd them and help them grow. But it's going to start with preparing tomorrow's leaders. So see the urgency. I beg you to see how urgent the situation is. Pray for God to help us correct and to, and to find our direction in this. Take action to get it started and then watch how God works. Because I promise if we pray and we start working on this, God's going to change the future. Absolutely. Leadership's necessary. It's vital. And there's a crisis of it, but it doesn't have to be a crisis. I hope that helps in some ways. Once again, you asked for it. So there you go. Amen. All right. We'll uh, stop right there. And I guess you have the time you have until we pick back up. So thanks for being so attentive and for participating.